Hey guys, welcome back to the next session of the CFI oral exam. We're gonna jump right into it here, but first, make sure you click on those links right below the video here. Print out that PDF sheet. That is your cheat sheet to this session of the CFI oral exam. Everything you need to know on there as we follow through with this video. You wanna make sure you're listening, you're watching, you're writing things down on that little cheat sheet to help you take some notes, engage all those senses. I know, this is kind of not the most engaging, most interesting material in the world. So we're trying to make it engaging, trying to make it engaging for yourself so you can retain all this information. Again, thank you so much to Lufthansa Aviation Training USA out here in Goodyear, Arizona for making these videos possible, for making this whole series possible. If you guys are looking for a place to become a CFI, a great place to work as a CFI once you have a little bit of time in your book, go ahead and check them out. Awesome place, great benefits. And other than that, let's go right back into the CFI oral exam. All right, guys, we are back here at Lufthansa Aviation Training USA in Goodyear, Arizona. Cheryl is still here to quiz me and continue moving through our CFI oral. Uh, what do we have for today, Cheryl? Well, today we're going to move into uh, flight planning and navigation. Awesome. So let's start with some of that. Sure. All right. So we'll jump right in. What cross-country training would you provide to our student from zero to 250 hours? Okay, so uh, we've got our 15-year-old student. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, he would need the cross-country training for his private and his first his commercial if we're going to be training him for that. Mm -hmm. So I would just jump right over to Part 61 and uh, pull it up here so I'm accurate. Under 61, uh, I would just simply come down to private pilots in what the aeronautical experience needs to be. It's going to tell me that he needs three hours of cross-country flight training in a single engine airplane. Uh, and he's going to uh, also need, as part of that, the 100-mile uh, the night cross-country for training. That would be kind of at a minimum. Then, of course, he'll do his solo cross-countries on his own. If I wanted to look at, after the fact, what I'd be doing for him as a commercial student, uh, I'd have to come down to 61129, mm -hmm. and that'll specify what he's going to need as a commercial applicant. And 61129 tells us uh, that on his own, he's going to have to somehow have 50 hours of cross country right. flight time, at least 10 in airplanes. Uh, but as far as the flight training aspect of it, he would need that one two hour cross country flight in a single engine airplane daytime. Uh, with a straight line distance of more than 100 nautical miles from the original point of departure, same thing at nighttime conditions. So, uh, you know, after simple twilight, basically, or, you know, when you could legally log the night flight time. Mm -hmm. Now, I could always, if I knew he was going for his commercial, make his private pilot training a little bit longer and do those with him during the private, and we could count those later on. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so his night cross country as a private, I could just make a little bit longer and use that towards the uh, commercial requirement. Okay. Uh, if we were really trying to you know, be ultra cheap here. <laughs> so, but that would um, basically be the extent of what I would have to train them on for okay. uh, cross-country operations. Good. Okay. So how would you teach the features of, say, the sectional chart? Uh, probably, you know, the best way I would teach it is give them a little scenario, right? So uh, we're going to be hanging around here. We're at the Goodyear Airport. Mm -hmm. And... I would say, hey, today we're going to go from Goodyear over to the Mobile Airport. And what do you see on this sectional chart? You know, what do we see along the way? And just talk about those few little things we see along, you know, four or six inches of sectional chart. We see the okay. mountains. We see this 45-12 number, meaning that's the peak of one of those mountains. Mm -hmm. uh, we have these big blue numbers, 49 here, that are min maximum uh, elevation figures. Okay. So we'd want to be probably 1,000 feet or so above that. That's a quick reference for us to flight plan or altitude that we're looking at. Uh, and then we can see, you know, that there's quite a bit of airspace around this area. Oh, yeah. So in teaching the sectional chart, you also would want to probably have airspace as a lesson before that. Mm -hmm. uh, but simply starting out there and then just moving a little bit bigger to where we could, you know, pick out things along the way. And it's really easy to look at the sectional chart and I guess miss some things. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I might mm -hmm. have them plan me something from Goodyear to Tucson mm -hmm. and then uh, tell me what it looks like along the way. Okay. Uh, you know, what he sees. And then I might just start pointing to it and asking him, well, what's this? What's that? What's that? So he right. starts to discover, oh, there's a lot more information on this thing than I really realize there is. Okay. And where's a good place to find the information if you don't know what it is? So the great thing about paper charts, uh, well, Foreflight can be really helpful, mm -hmm. Garmin Pilot, uh, so many different EFBs can be really helpful. 
Uh, the legend on the side here gives us a ton of information. Not every answer, uh, but this legend and you know the little actual, um, I guess you could call them appendices or side panels, um, have a lot more information on the chart as well. It pertains to what we're seeing on this map front and back. Okay. And then uh, we could always defer to the chart user's guide, which mm -hmm. has basically spells out all our symbols uh, for all charts, for approach plates, for sectionals, for flyway charts, for tack charts, for uh, low in route charts, high in route, all of those charts are going to be, uh, all those symbols will be spelled out in the chart user's guide for us. Okay, good. So on your little example of going mm -hmm. from Goodyear to Tucson, for example, yes. um, let's say we get to, we use, oh, the auction airport there mm -hmm. as just a checkpoint. But tell me about the airspace that you would expect from the ground up at auction. So right at auction airport, uh, at the ground, we're going to be standing in Class G airspace. Okay. Uh, daytime requirements are going to be one mile and clear of clouds. And as we move upward, uh, we're not going to encounter echo airspace until we hit about 1,200 feet. Okay. Uh, at 1,200 feet, on up to, all the way up to uh, 17,999 feet, we'll mm -hmm. be in Class E airspace, which is our basic 3152s. Okay. Um, even when we're down low, and then as we get up higher, uh, it becomes a little more stringent with five statute miles of visibility, 1,000 above, 1,000 below, okay. uh, mile horizontal. And how about Class G? What's that? Uh, class G, uh, when we're above 10,000. Or here at auction. Oh, yeah, Class G <laughs> here at auction, yeah. uh, down low is going to be one mile clear of clouds during the daytime. Okay. So right next to it is the Casa Grande Airport. Mm -hmm. And is that the same? Uh, it's a little different. So there we have this magenta vignette around it. So that's actually going to tell us that we have Class G up to 699, mm -hmm. 700 to 1199. I'm sorry, 700 to... 17,999 is going to be echo airspace. Okay. Uh, we're just outside of the Bravo there. So why would that occur there between those two different airports? Can you uh, guess? We can see kind of the alignment to the runway here mm -hmm. and how they have this magenta vignette that protects the general roundness of the airport and mm -hmm. then this approach corridor to the runway. Right. So I would say that there's probably an approach mm -hmm. uh, when you're landing to the northeast mm -hmm. and there's probably some circling minima attached to that approach. So they're really protecting it for the whole idea of airspace here is just to separate IFR and VFR aircraft. It's just separation of airplanes. And I would assume that the auction airport probably doesn't have any approaches going in there. Right. <laughs> it's fairly new. So above the Goodyear airport, well, mm -hmm. first of all, what kind of airspace is Goodyear in? Goodyear is sitting in a class D airspace from the okay. surface up to uh, 2,999 feet. Okay. And what do we need to have to go in and out of the Class D airspace there? Uh, to go in and out of regular Class D airspace, you just need two-way radio communication, okay. uh, nothing else. But because Goodyear lies within that 30-mile mode C ring mm -hmm. uh, of uh, Phoenix International or uh, Sun Harbor or whatever. Sky Harbor. Sky Harbor. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, then we're going to need a mode C transponder just to be flying in this general area around the Goodyear airport. Goodyear. Okay. And what is directly above it, do you know? Uh, directly above, so right at 3,000 feet, we start off with, uh, looks like it's going to be Bravo airspace, I would assume, or perhaps not. Yeah, spin this around and take a closer look. Can't quite crane my neck that direction. It's a little trickier one here. <laughs> yes. Uh, so we're going to be going up to, uh, up to but not including 3,000 feet would be the Delta airspace. Directly above that, we have on this inner ring, we're going to be at uh, 5,000 for the Bravo. So in between 3,000 and 4,999, we're going to be into Class E airspace. Mm -hmm. uh, and further out, it stays within, really hard to tell in this guy. It is, but yeah. It yeah. stays within that... Um, 5,000 there, and then this other little tiny section of the pie mm -hmm. actually is 3,000 to 5,999 would be echo, and then we get into the Bravo airspace there. Right. And for this particular quadrant, we have the Bravo airspace that is down to 4,000 feet mm -hmm. over top of the majority of the airport, really right over top of the runway there. Uh, 
And that looks like the last division they've made over top that's, of that's us. That's good. Very good. So one more thing, because this mm -hmm. is just a little odd for this area, mm -hmm. is the white stuff that's just to the west of Goodyear. Do you know so that white is? airspace is really weird. We just yeah. avoid it altogether. Okay. Uh, <laughs> what, conveniently okay. enough, it mm -hmm. says right here on the chart, special air traffic rule, uh, FAR Part 93. Anything in 93... Mm -hmm. Uh, basically spells out all our special air traffic rules or all our CIFRA, special flight rules areas. So um, it, it has a little bit of information here for us. If we really wanted to know what was going on uh, around this area, we could, there's two ways to do it. You could pick the phone and talk to somebody at Luke. Mm -hmm. um, be one way to do it. The best way to do it would just be to go to 14 CFR 93 mm -hmm. and read through what the actual rule is for that area. Um, Due to sometimes inconsistencies in the system, mm -hmm. uh, there's what the rule is, and we can follow the rule to the T. Still not a bad idea after reading the rule to pick up the phone and call them, because maybe right. they have a different interpretation of the rule than you do, <laughs> or they have a different way they like to do things right. despite the rule reading one way or another. Yeah. Uh, so just to you know, cover all your bases and make things flow smoothly sometimes, okay. you know, it's best to follow the rules to a T and then also follow all the imaginary rules as well. And how could we find a, a more detailed version of that? So uh, we're looking at a sectional chart right now. There's a couple varieties of more detailed maps out around the Phoenix area. So we have the TAC chart, okay. which is a terminal area chart. Uh, and when we call it a TAC chart, it's actually a terminal area chart chart. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and then uh, that's basically instead of a it's, it's, it's a twice enhanced scale, it's zoomed yeah. in two times, so it just gives us more detail of the local area. Yeah. And then we have a flyway chart. Okay. And the flyway chart uh, is going to be really good if we're flying VFR around the Broadway airspace, even right through it. Mm -hmm. uh, it gives us a really good picture, or kind of an overlay for us VFR pilots, of where all those SIDs and STARS are, where they're bringing in the big guys from, what altitudes those big jets are going to be at. Okay. So we can avoid those corridors like we mentioned uh, previously. We don't really want to be flying right underneath where all the Airbuses and Boeings are flying because of weight turbulence. Right. Uh, and they have some preferred routes that rather than getting vectored all around the airspace like crazy, if we just stick to those preferred routes, we might have a much easier time getting through the Bravo okay. airspace. Good. Okay. So are those charts legally required? Uh, what's legally required for us when we go flying is to be familiar with all aspects of our flight mm -hmm. and everything that pertains to that flight. So if we're flying from Goodyear to auction, yep. we have a sectional chart that gives us tons of information. But there's some information that's missing that you may find on a TAC chart, that you may also find on a flyway chart, and that you may also fly find in the uh, chart supplement or what used to be called the AFD. Mm -hmm. So with that, it's a little bit of a gray area, so the best thing you could do is get every single chart there is, and now we don't have to go out and buy paper charts anymore that expire every so often. Hmm. How, how would we know when this expires? This one's really easy to know when it expires. Mm -hmm. It expires when it says it does, <laughs> um, which is the 25th of April, 2019. Okay. So uh, we yeah. have a little bit of time on this one. Mm -hmm. um, it Technically, it expires in April, but this was printed probably back in September or something. Okay. Yeah. So it's already out of date. You know, they could have built a tower between now and, you know, three, four months ago. Right. How would and we know? We wouldn't have a clue. So that's where notums come into play. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why having all of your charts on an EFB, having some paper charts is a great backup, really good idea. But having everything on the EFB is so simple because okay. we can have all that stuff. It doesn't really cost us anymore. We pay the one time subscription fee and we have access to everything. Mm -hmm. Is there a place that we could find any updates to this chart? Uh, so they publish updates to the chart on the FAA website. Mm -hmm. uh, there's NOTAMs that would update the chart. Mm -hmm. And uh, aside from NOTAMs on the FAA website, I would say that would be the two uh, best sources to look at for any sort of chart updates. I think there's one more, but I'll have to double check that. Okay. <laughs> Possibly in the chart supplement. In the chart supplement. So. Right. Yes, um, that definitely would be a good thing to look at if it, they had updated you know, anything there. Yeah, okay. All right, so we talked about uh, plotting our course from Goodyear to Tucson. Mm -hmm. So how would you teach the available navigation methods with that kind of an example? 
Sure. So if we're going to go from the Goodyear to Tucson Airport, um, a number of different ways we could do it. Uh, my particular favorite is to bring this map with you and look out the window. Um, <laughs> what do we call that? We call that IFR, <laughs> uh, but it's not the kind of IFR <laughs> under Part 61. Okay. Um, Otherwise, we'd call it what? Uh, we would call that pilotage. Pilotage. Okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> You could also do it via dead reckoning. You mm -hmm. could go ahead and take your plotter here and say, I needed to fly about a 150 course, 140 course to get there. Mm -hmm. And that's true. So then we're going to account for the magnetic uh, magnetic variation here, which is fairly significant at 10 and a half degrees. So what is magnetic variation since you brought it up? Magnetic <laughs> variation um, is basically true north, the center of the earth, the center of the ball, the tip, mm -hmm. is not where the magnetic poles are. So our compass points north, but doesn't point to true north because the magnetic north, the magnetic epicenter, mm -hmm. is slightly offset. And the way the magnetic field works around the earth, it varies how much it's offset depending what latitude and longitude you happen to be at that day. Uh, so we have these isogonic lines um, I believe they're called that, and that right. they uh, they tell us basically what to account for. So when okay. we see ten and a half degrees east, mm -hmm. that east is least, west is best. <laughs> um, and what we would do is we'd say, hey, it's a one forty course to get to Tucson, but there's ten and a half degrees east here, so I'm going to have to take off about ten degrees. So now I'm going to have to fly about one thirty on the magnetic compass if I want to get to Tucson. And there's probably going to be some wind. Okay. Um, and so if I was doing this via, uh, via dead reckoning, I'd mm -hmm. have to account for that wind to some degree, try to put in a wind correction angle, and then measure roughly what my ground speed is going to be, and then I'll know how, about how long it should take me to get there. I'll keep watching my stopwatch, watch my compass, look down when I get towards that time, okay. and of course have some checkpoints along the way mm -hmm. to make sure that I'm on course and that the winds are what I thought they would be time-wise. Um, the other, the easiest way to do this that you know I'd probably teach the student later in training, uh, or even after they get their uh, certificate, is just how to press the D with the line through it uh, <laughs> and go direct. Uh, that's a really handy one. Just follow the magenta line. Super easy to do it that way. Mm -hmm. We could also do it via VORs. We have okay. a bunch of different VORs we could fly here. Mm -hmm. and there's actually even some Victor Airways in the area that once we okay. get to our first VOR, we could then link up with. Um, and basically fly VOR to VOR to VOR. The problem with that is the FAA's MON plan or the Minimum Operational Network plan where they're basically just axing half of these things because they're expensive, they're mm -hmm. antiquated, they require a lot of power. Uh, and so VORs break, they go down for maintenance, they don't get fixed very often. Uh, so that's kind of a limitation there. One of the limitations with going direct is batteries die, mm -hmm. electronics fail, alternators fail, and GPS satellites aren't always operational. Sometimes, mm -hmm. not so much around here, but certainly around Alaska and um, around military bases, they often are doing testing with GPS jamming. Right. And that happens to jam all the GPS equipment on your aircraft too if you're in that mm -hmm. area. So mm -hmm. there will be no GPS signal. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, we have pilotage, dead reckoning, GPS, uh, VOR, we have NDBs if we wanted to get really old school, mm -hmm. probably not even installed on the aircraft anymore. <laughs> uh, I don't see many NDBs in this particular well, area. There's a couple. There's one at Chandler, there's one at Marana, and there's one at Ryan. Gotcha. They're so we'd be going. pretty popular here because uh, we use them for training. So They're a yeah. little bit of a ways away. Mm -hmm. um, and you'd probably wind up doing a lot of that. Mm -hmm. um, but that's. As a backup, you could do that. Or if you just knew where your favorite radio station was located, you could always use that to navigate <laughs> uh, if you knew where they were broadcasting mm -hmm, from. Mm -hmm. uh, the other options we have would be you could kind of rely on approach control. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody with radar can give you vectors towards okay. a place, especially if you're getting lost. And if the student got totally lost, you know, if I sent them on a solo cross country and, hey, you've gone through all these options, you're still not sure, you're just freaking out. Well, our 911, so to speak, or our call for help is mm -hmm. just to twist the radio over to 121.5 or on some of our Garmin products, just press and hold the flip-flop key, it pops 121.5 in there. Mm -hmm. And you just say, hey, I'm a student pilot. I think I'm roughly around here. I need some help. And based on the fact that you took off from here, you've been flying for a half hour, you're not in Texas yet. Right. Um, <laughs> or Mexico. <laughs> yeah. You're in the general vicinity mm -hmm. of somewhere mm -hmm. uh, close by. Yeah. So... Uh, and somebody on there will be able to talk you through and help you out. 
uh, whether it's going to be a tower that hears you or an approach controller or another aircraft. Right. Good. Very good. Okay. So as we plan our flights, we are going to check, say, an AWOS mm -hmm. when we get to our next destination. Is yes. that true or magnetic for the winds? So uh, the best way to remember this is that if we hear something, it's magnetic. If we read it, it's true. Um, what you read is always true. The newspapers never lie. <laughs> and the, you just can't trust the fake news on TV. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> there you go. So uh, with our AWOS, it is going to be magnetic. Anything that we're hearing, ATIS, AWOS, ASOS, magnetic. Mm -hmm. And then our... Uh, what we're reading that comes to us in the cockpit in the forms of ADSB weather or METAR, what we're reading in terms of METAR or TAF, uh, you know, on the ground, that's going to be true. True. Okay. Uh, so around here, about a 10 degree difference. It's supposed to be. Yes. Goodyear doesn't always follow that rule. <laughs> yes, there's something on the chart I noticed about some weird magnetic stuff going on around here. No, uh, for some reason they report their METAR still in magnetic. Oh, they report it. I think that's okay. just them not... Not gotcha. doing it correctly. Okay, so um, what could affect your navigation instruments? Uh, so affecting navigation instruments, um, kind of like we had mentioned, uh, you know, with the VOR, mm -hmm. they could be down. So NOTAMs would be really helpful there. Okay. Um, their line of sight, their VHF transmissions. So being low on the other side of these mountains here, on the other side of the uh, Sierra Australias. Australia. Mm -hmm. um, that wouldn't work so well for us. Right. Um, so there's going to be certain radials that may be unusable below a certain altitude. Okay. Uh, certain radials may be broken on the VOR. Uh, there could be, you know, somebody just built a building that's blocking some of that. Uh, there could be a power outage. There could be the fact that VORs are kind of unreliable in your airplane in the first place. They never seem to be super accurate. Uh, uh, could be GPS outages, uh, which should be noted, you know, if the military is doing testing. Mm -hmm. Could be uh, any sort of, you know, just technical issues with an iPad, with uh, electronic issues. And uh, I guess the other big barrier to navigation, if you're doing pilotage or dead reckoning and there's fog and clouds below you, you're in a little bit of a pickle. So if you had to divert, how would you pick an alternate, say, in a situation um, like that? So, so if I'm going to be flying from Phoenix to Tucson and maybe halfway through, uh, you know, you lose the alternator, say, or something mm -hmm. like that, um, for that sort of scenario, it really depends on the scenario. Okay. So that sort of scenario, I'm thinking, okay, well, a non-towered airport's probably best. One of these airports with some little barbs on it is probably a great idea, too. Mm -hmm. I'd like to have some sort of battery power left over, so maybe I start shutting things off and try to save enough battery power just to listen, at least, to mm -hmm. who's flying around those airports, so I'm not just going in totally blind. And, you know, hopefully getting somewhere where there's some services, but landing as soon as practical as a student. And even if you have to land somewhere where there's not services, you know, that's okay too. Mm -hmm. um, as far as choosing where to it's got to be suitable, right? So mm -hmm. choosing a, you know, 2,500 foot long runway versus a 5,000 foot long runway, mm -hmm. maybe 5,000 feet's a little bit better. Right. Uh, choosing something if it's nighttime, mm -hmm. probably want to choose something with a beacon with some lighting. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's daytime, shouldn't matter terribly much. Uh, when you see an airport that's near some yellow, it's going to be a little bit easier to find because there's a town nearby there. Mm -hmm. And just choosing kind of what's along your route or what's uh, going to be, if there's any weather in the area, choosing something that's going to be near better weather. Mm -hmm. uh, just ultimately, you always want to stack the deck in your favor. Mm -hmm. So choose a bigger runway with more services with, you know, that's easier to find, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not near terrain or obstacles, those sorts of things. Yeah. In the summertime, we want to go someplace that has a building with air conditioning. <laughs> yes, uh, that's yes. <laughs> in this area anyway. <laughs> yeah, in the winter time, I guess you'd want to um, certainly around like Alaska in the Northwest, you'd want to find yeah. something that has some sort of building for warmth. Yeah, huh. exactly. So, how does GPS work? Um, GPS works uh, basically. We have, uh, you know, where we are, which is Earth. <laughs> And this is where I, we're somewhere in this general vicinity. <laughs> There's all these little satellites that orbit the Earth in geosynchronous orbit. So they, relative to us spinning, they don't really move relative to the ground. They mm -hmm. keep spinning. They're moving faster because they're further away from the center, but they're moving with us. Mm -hmm. And they keep adding some back. It used to be there was about 28 of them. Now there's mm -hmm. a few more. Uh, the idea is 
that these little satellites are nothing more than a clock with a broadcaster. So it's just like its own little radio station that just keeps telling, it just says what time it is. That's all it ever does. So it sends its signal of what time it is. This one sends its signal of what time it is. This one sends its signal of what time it is. And you can see that this one's longer than this and this. And so if all the clocks are synced together based on radio waves moving at the speed of light, and this one traveling a much greater distance, and this one traveling a little bit further than the other, the signals are gonna get there at a different time. And so when this one says it's 12.01 and one second, this one's going to be saying it's 12.01 and three seconds. And by that, our receiver, our cell phone, our iPad, our Garmin 430, our whatever GPS receiver in the airplane takes all those times and then stitches together a three-dimensional picture of where we're at in space. And if we only had three satellites, it would actually only give you a 2D picture. But if we can get a fourth satellite in there to get a little more data, now we can get a 3D picture. And if we can get a fifth satellite in that picture, then we can get what's called RAIM. Mm -hmm. And RAIM is Radio Autonomous Integrity Monitoring. And that basically, with the fifth satellite, looks at it can look at all five and tell if one's off. Mm -hmm. So if one's giving you a bad signal and the speed of light is constant, but not entirely. There's some variations in it, you know, over great distances uh, based on what medium it's moving through. And that can affect the, the integrity or the accuracy of our GPS. So having those five satellites is really what we're looking for. Usually we can lock on to seven, eight, 10, 11 of them. Uh, pretty easily. You're never going to lock on to all 28 because the Earth's in the way mm -hmm. and it's still a line of sight signal. Okay. Uh, good. So does that yeah. mostly answer the question? Yeah, yes. that's good. So how would you teach your student to make a go or no-go decision? Uh, go, no-go decision is we're going to go right back to uh, ADM, the three P's or the paid checklist, I'm safe. We're looking at everything. Okay. So it starts off as hey, you know, am I ready to go? Is the airplane ready to go? What's the environment doing? What's the weather doing? Um, what's the overall trip, you know, like how challenging is this? I'm going from Goodyear to Tucson. There's a little bit of terrain in between mm -hmm. here and there. Terrain makes things interesting when the sun's out. Right. Um, terrain makes things interesting when there's wind blowing. Mm -hmm. You know, so what is the wind? You know, is it, is it only 15 knots? That doesn't sound like much, but that can get pretty interesting with some mountains around. Is it, you know, a really clear sunny day? that can get things interesting. Is it overcast in a high overcast? That could be great. Is it, you know, possibly a lower overcast? What's the temperature and dew point spread doing? So following a methodical checklist mm -hmm. of all of those things, uh, and that's typically what I give students when they're going through cross country training is here's what we have to know to make sure we're good. So first we have to go over the airplane. We have to go over our flight planning. What are we even getting ourselves into? Like, did we just plan to go from Goodyear to, you know, like, Anchorage, you know, like that's quite a flight here. Mm -hmm. um, let's look at this in a little smaller chunk. So let's look at Goodyear to Tucson or something, or Goodyear to a, a near airport, and really examine all those factors. So you complete that checklist for you to make sure you're not missing anything. So it'd be really easy to get up in the air and realize, oh, I forgot. Well, where's all this fog coming from? Mm -hmm. I didn't check the temperature dew point. I checked the taps. I checked this. I checked everything else, right. but I didn't check that. Um, and so using that methodical checklist to make sure you go to aviationweather.gov, you use the GFA tool, you get that area forecast picture, you call and you talk to the briefer, you cover all your bases. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really what's gonna formulate into your go, no-go decision. And then you can kind of compile all that into the risk matrix and make that risk assessment and say, okay, this is a low risk flight or this is a medium or a high risk flight, I shouldn't do it. And then at the end of the day, after you do all that work, you just kind of trust your gut. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you still just have this gut feeling that everything looks okay, but you just feel like maybe today's not the day to fly or you don't feel so good about it, then just take the money that you're going to spend on flying your airplane and go rent yourself a nice Corvette and drive to wherever you have to go uh, for the day instead. Right. It'll be cheaper. It'll be cheaper. Uh, <laughs> okay. Okay, so we've decided to go on our cross country. Everything mm -hmm. is good. So how? what would be the purpose of filing a flight plan? The main reason you would be filing a flight plan um, would be search and rescue services. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I say I'm going to be filing a VFR flight plan from Goodyear to Tucson, then... Uh, I would tell them what my route is, my intended altitude, the color of the aircraft, souls on board, fuel on board. And I said, I'm mean, going to get there at noon, 1230 rolls around, and I still haven't called and closed the flight plan. Now they're going to 
start search and rescue services, which really means the first search is going to call the FBO and be like, hey, is this guy on the ground eating in the restaurant? You can go tell him to call us so we can yell at him. Mm-hmm. And usually, you know, they just say, hey, don't do that again. Right. Um, but if they can't make contact with you because you actually ran out of gas or you had some sort of engine failure and you're stuck in this field with no cell phone service and you weren't able to get off a radio call before you had to ditch in some farmer's field here, then they're going to start looking for you along that route. And having the flight plan, knowing that you were flying you know, to Tucson via the um, Stanfield VOR mm-hmm. is much better than them just looking direct or looking over this wide swath of area. They can look directly along that route to the Stanfield VOR and have a little more uh, specific idea of what they're looking for, uh, especially you know what kind of aircraft you have, all that sort of stuff. Uh, yes. But. Okay. What are the three ways that we could file a flight plan? To file a flight plan, uh, we could pick up the phone and call a briefer. Mm-hmm. Uh, we could file it through our iPad, mm-hmm. uh, Garmin Pilot, ForeFlight, all those wonderful EFB apps. We can file a flight plan right through there. Mm-hmm. Um, even when you file it, you can't. You still have to activate it somehow. Right. Um, so that's two separate stages. And then, uh, lastly, we could uh, file uh, and activate the flight plan in the air. We could even okay. file the flight plan over uh, flight service frequency. Okay. So how would we contact flight service if we wanted to do that airborne? Uh, so say we take off out of Goodyear, mm-hmm. and I want to go ahead and file. Um, I'm flying. It's taking me forever to get to Tucson, so I want to file a flight plan because I've got some time to kill. Uh, we've climbed up, and the nearest frequency to contact flight service on, I'm seeing that we've got one here for Stanfield. It's not my favorite because it's a 122.1R, mm-hmm. and I hate the idea of having to transmit on 122.1 and then listen to them over 114.8 mm-hmm. and have you know the VOR in the background all that sort of stuff so mm-hmm. I'm looking to see if we have any other RCOs in the area that we might be able to get a hold of them on up by Phoenix up by Phoenix mm-hmm. so on this chart they've combined it with the Phoenix VOR box mm-hmm oh okay mm-hmm. so we've got um, over the Phoenix VOR uh, right at the location we could use 122.2 mm-hmm. we could use 122.6 and we can transmit and receive on that frequency to talk to Prescott Radio okay. uh, Prescott Flight Service Station so we'd call them up and just tell them hey Prescott Radio Cessna 12345 uh, our position and transmitting receiving over the Phoenix VOR 122.2 Okay. And they'd say, uh, stand by, you're number 25 in the queue. This is a <laughs> flight training area. We have a ton of students today. Mm-hmm. We'll get back to you in three hours. And then you'll land in Tucson and you can skip the whole process. There you go. Pretty yeah. close. <laughs> but let's say that doesn't happen. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so if that didn't happen, then uh, they would basically say, what can we do for you today? And you'd say, I'd like to file a flight plan. And you go through that same, I believe it's 17 box flight plan or that mm-hmm. same flight plan form. It's a great thing just to have like, tape to your headliner just so you can run through it. Mm-hmm. You want to give it to them in order. You want to give them box one, box two, box three, box four. And you don't want to make them say, okay, tell me time and route, fuel on board, color aircraft. And then you respond to those two things. Just give him one, two, three, four boxes and him say copy. And then give him the next three or four boxes. He'll say Roger or copy. And you keep moving through that. It goes a lot quicker because otherwise you're trying to have this conversation with this person but you're both probably stepping on each other at the same time. And so it, it gets to be quite a mess. Uh, so having a nice, you know, form to, to flow with to, uh, to follow makes it a lot okay. easier. So let's say we decided to train, you've decided to train your student for their first night cross country. Mm-hmm. So how would you prepare them for their night flight? Let's start with that. So um, for night flying, mm-hmm. uh, it would start off with some homework, right? Mm-hmm. So we'd be sending them a lesson plan, uh, say something uh, like this. So what I would do is I would send them uh, basically this lesson to do beforehand. So this is going to be uh, basically their preparation for night flying. They're going to watch videos. They're going to see what it actually looks like so that they can uh, sort of expect uh, or know what to expect when we go flying at night, uh, know how the world around them works and what the lights look like around airports so it's not all totally foreign and they're not in awe the entire time that they're Mm -hmm. flying. Once we go through this, uh, we're going to be covering within this lesson airport lighting, Mm -hmm. how it works, the different types of airport lighting, 
uh, what it basically means to us, how it helps us you know, visualize the runway at night, and then all those nighttime illusions and how our eyes work at night. So uh, things like our eyeball, uh, a rough approximation of how our eye works, is going to be light comes in from the world around us. And back here we have cones, and then we have these rods. And this is a very rough approximation <laughs> of the human eye. The idea here is that at night, the light comes in and it hits our cones, but the cones aren't used that much at night. The rods are used more, so we actually have better night vision, but slightly off-center viewing. Our peripheral vision is a little bit better at night than what we're directly staring at. And the rods also rely a lot on oxygen to process that light. So uh, being able to, here's some of our better drawings of mm -hmm. the human eye. Uh, being able to have oxygen on board or stay at a lower altitude really helps with that. They say that it's recommended to be breathing supplemental oxygen above 5,000 feet at night. So really a 5,000 foot density altitude, uh, you know, is, uh, is what we're kind of looking at there. Mm -hmm. uh, so most of the time we're gonna be flying above that, especially around here in Arizona. Mm -hmm. Having some sort of supplemental oxygen at night will help our eyes process the light a little better. It makes everything brighter to us. Okay. Now, other oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Keep going. Um, other considerations we're going to be taking uh, in advance of this, besides going through all the airport lighting and all that, is talking to them about how they're going to prepare themselves for night flight. So, you know, I mean, I know it sounds silly, but eating mm -hmm. carrots actually helps. You know, having the proper diet and being healthy mm -hmm. will really help you see well at night. Uh, the other things that you're going to be doing are to talk to them about how to set the cockpit lighting, how to set up the airplane for themselves, how to set their iPad lighting. If it's a glass cockpit, they wanna know how to manually brighten and dim all the instruments. Um, if it's a steam gauge cockpit, there's probably some instrument lighting that you wanna be able to know how to manually brighten and dim. Mm -hmm. Really important to always have a headlamp with you, a red headlamp for the purpose of, they say carry a flashlight, but you can't fly the airplane and hold mm -hmm. the flashlight at the same time. <laughs> so the headlamp really helps here. Mm -hmm. And the red light doesn't blind as much at night so red light does help and there's a couple other colors and a couple of debates about mm -hmm. how valid that whole red light thing really is but according to the faa they still really like red light okay <laughs> um so we'll stick with that for now okay. uh in terms of what we're going to do on pre-flight mm -hmm. we're going to want a very bright flashlight and not necessarily a red one because although you want to protect your eyes it takes about 20 30 minutes for them to adjust from seeing bright light to being ready for nighttime for those mm -hmm. pupils to dilate and get bigger and let more light kind of increase the aperture so to speak of your eye okay. uh the trouble is if you're looking at your airplane with a red light mm -hmm. things just should, don't show up the same right. and you want a really bright white light because that's what you're normally pre-flighting in bright white light during the daytime uh from the sun to see any oil leaks, see any cracks forming, see any screws that are just ever so slightly loose that are gonna come out during flight. Uh, and so you gotta pre-flight, and then you gotta wait, you know, 20, 30 minutes before you go fly. Mm -hmm. uh, we would talk about things like, I said, you know, how the uh, the runway lights work and how we would like to ultimately let the lights turn off on them, <laughs> you know, uh, mm -hmm. before they take the runway or something, just so they can experience that feeling of being in this nice bright airport and all of a sudden everything going black and then seeing that in training so they don't freak out when that happens uh, when they actually go flying you know, on their own. Mm -hmm. And then of course we would uh, talk about how we're going to be landing the aircraft if we don't have any lights. So we have an alternator failure, a fuse blows, a lightning light just burns out. It's very possible to land the aircraft with no lights. Right. Uh, and we would talk about how we could do that basically, setting up on a nice stable approach down to the runway, flaps fully configured, stable power setting, just coming down, letting the aircraft sink into that, you know, uh, to those lights on the edge of the runway around you and uh, use your peripherals. And of course, it's hard to demonstrate for them, but you never want them to ever try to attempt to land on a runway without lights at night. It mm -hmm. doesn't go well. It's really, really difficult, mm -hmm. um, especially if there's no moon out. Mm -hmm. Aside from that, we would also talk about 91205 and the additional equipment we have to have on board working for us during night flight. Uh, and then uh, a little bit about reference to instruments. Say you go around at night and you have those illusions of adding power. It makes you feel like you pitch up so you might push forward. Uh, okay. You take off out of 
some of these airports where there's no surrounding lights mm -hmm. of the city at all mm -hmm. and you're off the runway the lights fall away behind you and there's just blackness in there's front of you on a night with no stars and no moon there's no horizon and mm -hmm. it's just the same as being in the clouds at that point and you have to be 100 percent on your uh, your instruments and really scanning outside and inside but really relying on those instruments to keep the wings level keep the airplane climbing the number of accidents of people taking off in vfr conditions but you know, with no uh, no light at night and, you know, getting into one of those, you know, left-turning uh, spirals down to the ground. Right. Okay. So you mentioned earlier about using oxygen at night. Mm hmm So what's, is there something special about aviation oxygen versus, say, medical oxygen? Yes. Yeah, so uh, you don't want to use just any oxygen when you're filling oxygen bottles on an airplane. Mm -hmm. uh, we fly... Uh, in cold temperatures mm -hmm. and regular medical oxygen because it's typically going to be administered indoors mm -hmm. if there's any sort of moisture in it it's going to be liquid and that's fine it'll just flow through the bottle but when you're dropping the pressure on a bottle it gets cold and right. so if we have any moisture in our aviation bottles and we're up at you know 10 degrees fahrenheit negative 20 degrees fahrenheit uh, plus we're dropping the temperature on the bottles as we take oxygen out that moisture could freeze and then stop the flow of oxygen. Mm -hmm. And then we have a bunch of oxygen behind some ice <laughs> and you definitely don't want to hold your lighter to it to try to melt it. <laughs> so uh, we want to use aviation oxygen because that has specifically been, you know, had all the moisture removed from it. Okay. So it's good and dry and it'll serve its purpose. Okay, good. And what other times might we want to use oxygen? Um, other times we'd want to use oxygen, uh, we could look into 91, it'll tell us that anytime we're above 12.5, uh, between 12.5 and 14,000, uh, the crew would need oxygen if we're there for more than 30 minutes. Okay. Uh, if we go above 14,000, we need oxygen right away as the crew, mm -hmm. and above 15,000, passengers need oxygen right okay. away, or at least offer it to them. You can't, can't force yeah, them to can't take it. Um, if the kids are screaming, you know, <laughs> hand it to them, and if they don't put it on, so be it. <laughs> So could you quickly describe how a pressurized cabin works? Sure, so a pressurized cabin, uh, probably best draw a little diagram here. A pressurized cabin, it's gonna need, it can't just go on any old airplane. It needs to have some sort of pump to pressurize it in the first place. So if we're going to have a pressurized cabin, uh, say that this is our fancy propeller and our cabin, so we've got our cabin here, we've got our engine compartment, and the engine is going to have either be a turbine engine, so it's going to have some bleed air coming off of the turbo, um, or off the engine itself, off the compressor stage, or it's going to be a turbocharged engine. Uh, that could be a piston engine with a turbocharger, again, taking some bleed air off of the compressor stage, compressing the air and flowing it into the cabin. So now we can create pressure in our cabin. We have to regulate the cabin pressure somehow, so we need to put a hole in there somewhere, mm -hmm. but we probably need to kind of regulate this hole with a little bit of a valve. And that valve is now going to meter how much flow goes out of the airplane, and it could close to pressurize the cabin, it could open to allow air out. There may also be a dump valve involved, so there could be another valve that maybe weight on wheels or when we land, uh, or an emergency, you know, dump valve that would actually depressurize the cabin very quickly for us. Uh, why you would want that is when you land, you want it to depressurize, so if you have to open the door rapidly... You could. You could. <laughs> uh, if the airplane's pressurized, you won't be opening any doors. Mm -hmm. Now, in combination with this, we're going to have our normal altimeter, but we're also going to have another gauge that would be our cabin altitude, because we want to know how much pressure is in the cabin, basically. So, if our altimeter says we're at, you know, 15,000 feet, our cabin altitude we'd like to keep it at 8,000 and below. So to lower the cabin altitude, we would want more air to come in. And this is all typically done by some sort of, you know, automatic regulator. And the regulator is typically connected to one of our outflow valves that just opens and closes to meter how much air is going in and out. Um, so it's those key components, a little bit more complicated, and this is kind of an oversimplification. We're gonna have a dump valve, a regulator valve, our normal altitude, our cabin altitude, in some way of pumping air into that cockpit itself. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Well, that sounds good. Let's get back to some airspace. Sure. Okay. So around here we have some special use airspace. Could you talk to me a little bit about that? Sure. Um, we've got uh, the Lucifer that we had mentioned. Mm -hmm. 
um, which is you know uh, one key. Mm -hmm. Cipher information, like we said, found in part 93, and they're usually denoted, um, you know, a little different between Cipher and special air traffic rules, I guess, but um, it, we have that white area around there. Mm -hmm. uh, Ketchikan, Alaska has that same white area. Mm -hmm. And then we could find like around the Grand Canyon where we have that blue line that denotes the Cifra mm -hmm. around the Grand Canyon. We also have things uh, like restricted areas. We have MOAs, uh, which are ones right here. They're all uh, yeah, down here. Yes, all over, <laughs> all over the place around here. Uh, we have alert areas, mm -hmm. uh, meaning tons of students flying around. Mm -hmm. uh, MOAs can cruise through them no problem, but if they're hot, really want to watch out, find a lot more information about them on the side panel of the chart, okay. find a lot more information by talking to the controlling agency, list on the side panel of the chart, or with an EFB, usually you can just tap on it. It'll tell you who the controlling agency is, get a hold of center, get a hold of somebody that you know, is in charge of that airspace. Uh, for restricted areas, we can fly through them, but we're gonna, again, wanna contact the controlling agency, make sure it's cold, and they'll tell us, hey, the area's cold, we, you can go ahead and fly through it. Mm -hmm. uh, if there's a prohibited area, I don't see any prohibited airspace around here. Maybe that's mm -hmm. another restricted airspace. Um, prohibited airspace, yeah. we're not going to fly through um, Period. Mm -hmm. It's prohibited, meaning it's just not going to happen. Yeah, I don't think we have any around here. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, controlled firing areas. Mm -hmm. I don't see any around here. I know there's some around the Great Lakes and uh, further yeah. up north. CFAs, um, they're not actually charted. Mm -hmm. uh, they're just going to be places where the military is shooting off big guns. And they monitor for aircraft in the area, so they're supposed to shop shooting their big guns when we get nearby. Mm -hmm. um, National Security Area, NSA. Uh, I know there's some out in the desert. Don't believe there's any on our sectional chart here today. That I'm aware but of. Yeah. that would be another area that we'd want to avoid okay. and simply just uh, you know, call up and get some information on if we had to fly through there. Mm -hmm. um, there's going to be areas that they'll say, you know, for reasons of national security, pilots are requested to maintain you know, such and such altitude. Mm -hmm. uh, and aside from that, we have warning areas that we'll find offshore very similar to uh, a warning area is similar to a restricted area, but you can always cruise through it, uh, hot or cold. Uh, so I guess it's a little bit more similar to an MOA in that regard. Uh, we have the ADAs here with the border with Mexico mm -hmm. and uh, air defense identification zone. Basically, if we're going to be crossing the ADAs, we need to be on a DVFR flight plan or an IFR flight plan, have a discrete squat code, and uh, you know, have, be in contact with ATC uh, in that regard on some sort of flight plan. And other than that, I uh, believe that mostly covers it. Okay. How uh, about some TFRs? Sure, TFRs. Uh, we won't find on the chart because it's paper, so it doesn't light up very well, uh, like our iPads do. <laughs> right. But we'll see TFRs potentially pop up depending on what EFB provider you're using if you're connected to the internet. Uh, TFRs are temporary flight restrictions. Okay. Now, they've kind of revised the whole sporting game TFR, mm -hmm. uh, where it used to just be the, the three miles, 2,000 feet, 30,000 people deal. Now it's, if there's a TFR, they're going to publish it. You don't have to know about every single football game going on between here <laughs> and wherever you're flying to. Mm -hmm. You call flight service, you get the briefing through your iPad, however you do a legal briefing, uh, 1-800-weatherbrief.com, the TFRs will be on there if there are any. It'll specify the dimensions, the width, the height, uh, the active times when they're, it goes into effect and whatnot. Sometimes you can fly through TFRs with ATC permission. You can never fly through one without ATC permission. And sometimes they won't let you through anyways, especially when it's like the president or vice president. Mm -hmm. uh, but when they're just football game TFRs, oftentimes they'll let you cruise through. The Disney TFR in Florida you can fly right through with ATC permission. So uh, it's for reasons of security or flight safety even. They might have a TFR for like the space shuttle launch mm -hmm. or you know for rocket launch, for drone activity, things like that. Uh, and we can find out simply, you know, through the briefing. Good. Okay. Um, <clears throat> in our cockpit, what would be a good resource for NOTAMs and TFRs? Uh, while we're flying around, they can pop up at any time. Mm -hmm. So the best way to stay alert to it, if you had ADSB or some sort of, you know, data service coming into your airplane, you could potentially find out, um, if you have some sort of data to your iPad, okay. it may pop up. Uh, 
However, the best way is going to be to call flight service. You know, if you're on a long flight, mm -hmm. get another flight briefing halfway through your flight. Talk to flight service that way. Uh, you can go through your iPad. You can talk to approach or center. They're going to be aware of any TFRs that are popping up. And uh, using those resources just over the radio is going to be one of your best bets. Okay. Good. Awesome. I think we're ready for a break. That sounds great to me. All right, so that is the end of this session of the CFI oral exam. We'll pick it back up in the next video. If you're looking for a good place to be a CFI, well, look no further than Lufthansa Aviation Training USA, Goodyear, Arizona. Great airplanes, great place to work, great benefits, and really good place to build your time or to become a career CFI. So thank you so much to them for making this video series possible. We will see you guys in the next video series. Now there's a little bit delay in these coming out here on YouTube. So if you're looking for these videos to come out a little bit faster, well, click on the link below and that will direct you to LufthansaAviationTrainingUSA.com, their website. And you can find this complete series available there on their website. Other than that, we will see you guys in the next session.